It's time to sit down and relax for the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A with your host, Doug. Hey there, Doug here. I hope you're staying safe. So our next movie that we're going to be covering, we actually recorded already. We had uh, Chris Egan back from our Text Chainsaw Massacre 3 Leatherface episode. And uh came out great. The Fly 2 is, uh, it's something. So we obviously, well, what do we do? We interview someone who worked on that movie to provide some behind the scenes. So we interviewed Jerry Wasserman. He had a small role in the movie. He was only on it for a few days. His character was a scientist named Sims. He gets his arm bit off by a mutant dog. And it's a pretty big part of the storyline. Uh, so, yeah, Jerry was great. He talked about how he got into acting. It was kind of on a fluke. He uh, had a crush on a girl. And then over the years, he's been in so much. 21 Jump Street, uh, Wise Guy, uh He was in the movie Alive. He had a really cool story about that whole process of filming. Uh, You name it, he's been in it. Almost 200 credits. And uh, I know you're going to love him. Really down-to-earth guy. Here is Jerry Wasserman. Hey, Jerry. How you doing? Hi, Doug. Very well, thanks. How you doing? Great, great. Thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Sure. My pleasure. Yeah, it's so great. So when I was sending those emails out, my wife started watching... Oh, what's that show you were just on? Uh, <laughs> I River, Zombie? River, oh, uh, Riverdale. Uh, Riverdale, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It happened to be right after you said you would take the time. Uh, I was looking at your IMDb, and I was like, oh, are you on episode 28 yet? Uh, and she's like, oh, that's the next one. And then we watched your scene in that. Yeah, I got ripped off there because that was the whole subplot that never got developed. I was oh, going to really? come back. They were going to have a big town meeting to see who, you know, who would get the money, and and they just dropped the subplot altogether. So that was the end of my uh, my Riverdale experience. So when you sit down, say for like a role like that, do they tell you that hey, this character, Mister Lazenby, is going to be in X amount of episodes, or no? You know what? When you get the breakdown for the audition, they'll say yeah. a poss- they'll say possible recurring. Oh, okay. You know, so they don't commit to anything um, uh, unless it's, you know, unless it's a real major recurring role that they've already they've already kind of uh, arranged to fit into subsequent episodes. But but usually they're, you know, the writers are about about one episode ahead of of yeah. <laughs> uh, of where, when they're where they're shooting. So, yeah, nobody, you know, the rule in Hollywood, nobody knows anything. Right? I bet. <laughs> True. Yeah, so uh, so where'd you grow up? Where's I know you're in Canada now. I grew up in New York. I grew up in uh, awesome. in the Bronx and Queens and uh, Long Island. Oh, and awesome. I came I live to in New Jersey. Yeah, that's I, I checked out the uh, the area code. Oh, yeah, okay, my good. first my first wife was from New Jersey, so uh, oh, we're practically related, you and I. We are, yeah. <laughs> that was cool growing up in the Bronx. Yeah, it was a different Bronx then. It was, you know, oh, it was kind of lower middle class um, Jews and Italians. And uh, it was, you know, it was a pretty kind of ordinary place to grow up. Yeah. Did you Yankee? Are you a Yankee fan because of it? I was a rabid Yankee. I lived and breathed the Yankees. and That's But when awesome. I left New York, I kind of lost interest in baseball, to be honest. I don't even follow it anymore. I was, yeah, I was a Yankee fan. I was a Yankee fan, and I was a Cincinnati Reds fan because I I was actually born in Cincinnati. So oh okay, those are two yeah. teams to uh, for a while. Those are two of the best teams to root for. Well, the Yankees <laughs> when I was growing up, it was the Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra era. You know, Hank Aaron. I mean, Hank. Uh, 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 what's his name again? Played right Maris? field. Hank. Hanks or somebody. Oh. Maris came along a little bit later, but the real golden age was kind of the kind of the fifties and. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was. It was. Uh, it was a great place to grow up if you were a sports fan, because the Yankees always won, right? <laughs> I know that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm named after Thurman Munson. My middle name. Oh, really? Is Thurman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there then you go. Right after that, you had you had the Reds in the '70s, and then they. Uh, who were you rooting for when they faced off in the '76 series? Well, by that time, by that time, I was oh, I was gone. living in Vancouver, and I was no longer really following baseball. I'd become a hockey fan. Oh, nice! Well, <laughs> I think I, I think that's the only way they let you into Canada. 
<laughs> well, pretty, mu- pretty much. I, I'm a homer, you know. There was no like home baseball team to root for. I wasn't gonna like yeah. root for the Seattle Mariners when they yeah. came along. I could give a crap about that. So, <laughs> I uh, somebody take took me to a hockey game and I got hooked pretty quick. It's a very, oh, uh, that's awesome. very addictive game to follow. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to be at. But yeah, so uh, so so when did you when did you first get interested in? Hey, you know what? I want to be an actor. Well, in college, my second year in college, I went to a small uh, college on Long Island called Adelphi, and okay. and, uh, and um, I, I sort of had a crush. And I'd never been on I'd never been on the stage or anything, and uh, I had kind of had a crush on this girl. And um, they were auditioning for a musical, and the musical was going to play at Adelphi in the fall, and then it was going to go on a USO tour in the winter to Germany. Whoa. And so I thought, wow, this would be a really cool thing to do with this girl. Cause she was going to get a part in it for sure. And so I uh, I kind of worked up an audition, and I had to sing and act and um, got the part and went on this USO tour and spent eight weeks in Germany entertaining GIs in uh, some of the weirdest places. And this was 19, the winter of 1966 uh, when the Vietnam War was just heating up. and yeah. All these guys just cu- couldn't wait to get to Vietnam. They couldn't wait. They hated really? being in Germany. They hated being uh, in Germany because all they did was drill and drill and drill and, you know, wait for the cold, wait for the cold war to turn hot. And they were, you know, their job was going to be to like hold off the Russian tanks for an hour, uh, until the American missiles could get there. Yeah. And, uh, so all they wanted to do was go to Vietnam. It was so, it was so interesting in retrospect. It was really interesting. But for us. That is really for interesting a, hearing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was interesting being there, and but for a first time actor, it was just. I mean, you know, they treated they treated us. We were a bunch of college kids, and they treated us like Bob Hope, right? We were just celebrities. Yeah. They'd always ask for autographs, and I thought, wow, this is the life for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, before that, did you ever do anything like that, or was it just because, hey, no. you know what? She's going to be it. Really, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was I was taking. Um, so I started off in engineering and first year and I and I dropped out pretty quickly and so in second year I was kind of looking around for something to major in and so I took just a whole bunch of different courses including they didn't actually have drama courses that they were called they they were called speech courses and so I took this speech course and uh so we did like monologues we had to do we had to like learn and recite monologues from plays and so that was my really, and that's when I auditioned for this this show. So that was my first and only experience of performing, and uh, yeah, I just lucked into it, and um, uh, and then I kept at it while I so I majored in English all the way through my my various degrees, but I uh, I always did theater on the side, I acted on the side, and. When I came to Vancouver, I was really lucky. My timing was really great. I came here in 1972, and professional theater in Canada was just really kind of getting off the ground. And in Vancouver, um, it was it was like the Wild West here. Like no one ever asked for your no one ever asked for a resume. No one had an agent. You just auditioned. So I just threw myself into a whole bunch of auditions, and and I ended up. And getting some really nice parts, and and so I was doing theater in the was doing quite a bit of theater while I was teaching English. Um, and in the mid '80s, uh, Hollywood kind of discovered Vancouver, and um, uh, there was a pretty small core of professional actors and a very small core of middle-aged male character actors with New York accents. So, like, I was golden. I, you know, yeah. I was just the guy they were looking for for practically every show. And <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I got, I, I just, I got a lot of work in the 80s and 90s. So on IMDb, they're not always right. I don't even know if you ever check it out, but. Oh, I do. Your, don't worry. <laughs> oh, you do? Okay. Oh, yeah. So, I, so I'm guessing your first credit's right? Low visibility? <clears throat> Yeah, that was a local, uh, a locally made um, film by a uh, a Canadian director who actually taught at one of the local colleges here. Yeah. Okay. Now, at this time, when you're teaching, do you have your doctorate yet? Oh yeah. Cornell? 
Yeah, I got my doctorate in 72, and I got the job at UBC and came out here and um, thought I'd stay for a year or two, and here I am, you know, like 45 years later. Yeah. So, that's, you know, life, life kind of steers you where it wants rather than vice yeah. versa. But um, I, I was totally, I was totally lucky. I mean, again, I came to Vancouver just at the time when the city was kind of growing up into like a world class, interesting city, and professional theater was just coming along. And then I was just in exactly in the right place when, when the film industry took off in the mid '80s, and I, I had a great. Uh, my teaching job was really terrific, and. It was like the best day job an actor could have because I had lots of flexibility and there were lots of underemployed, um, over-educated people here who I could hire to take classes for me if uh, if I got a, an acting gig. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so I was living the dream. I, you know, I, I, I really, I was very lucky to be able to to have these two wonderful careers simultaneously. And then I met my now wife in in 1980 around 1980 and um so i have a wonderful canadian family and uh blah 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 and i like <laughs> well, it yeah no that's great and then pretty early on in your career uh in 87 you were you, you had a series the new adventure yeah. of beans baxter yeah that was that was fantastic so this was the first year of fox the fox network started in 87 and it started, okay. they only did weekends, right? They only did, um, <clears throat> I think maybe it was only Saturday and Sunday nights. I don't think even think they did Friday nights. <clears throat> and they had like uh, four or five shows on, fri- on on one night and four or five shows on the other night. And, um, and yeah, so Beans Baxter was, uh, was among the first shows on Fox. It was um, the showrunner, the, the brains behind it was this crazy guy who called himself Savage Steve Holland, um, <laughs> who wrote all the episodes and directed all the episodes, and he was just this wonderful, crazy, nutty guy. And um, it was kind of a like a kind of a get smart ish series, but the get smart character was really um, the smart character was a kid, and uh, and it turns out that his father was um, secretly working for the you know, the intelligence services, and he'd been kidnapped by the bad guys. And so Beans, young Beans, is kind of recruited by me. I was sort of his recruiter uh, to um, to work uh, for the intelligence service and to help to find his father. And it was just a wonderful, crazy show that had... A lot of a lot of really really interesting guest stars like G. Gordon Liddy, who just come out of jail after Watergate, was oh, one wow. of the guest stars. And um, <laughs> D. Snyder from Twisted Sister had a whole episode around him, um, where we do a um, uh, uh, we we do. <laughs> um, and anyway, he was really great. And um, yeah, so that was that was wonderful. I mean, I was again, I was really just learning my craft. I'd only been doing it for a couple of years because acting for the camera is a whole lot different than acting on stage. And um and I kind of stumbled into this wonderful show which unfortunately got canceled in its second season. Um but it was it was pretty it was pretty cool. It was certainly a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. They have the episodes on YouTube. And it, oh, yeah. it must have been it must have been surreal, like the first time that you sat down with your friends, family. I'm sure you told a lot of people what it was going to be on. And oh yeah. You were like the you were like the intro to the show. You did the yeah. voiceover, like the. That's right. I did the voiceovers. Yeah. There were a lot of cool things about it. Like Eleanor Donahue played Bean's mother, and she was, you know, she was the daughter on Father Knows Best. So there was like this oh, wow. whole history of television that was incorporated into this this show it was just just delightful that's great and then not not too long after i know you, i know you've done out of anybody i've interviewed i've interviewed probably right around 15 people you have the most credit so i don't blame you not remembering you know, your time <laughs> on 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 fly two. Oh, oh i remember the, i remembered my time i just didn't i just didn't remember that i didn't remember the movie but i did oh, watch okay. it i did watch oh, it again so yeah oh, you did okay 
Yeah, I, I had forgotten how important the dog was. I mean, my whole scene was with the, you know, that dog turning the, yeah. his sweet, wonderful, love, loving pet dog into this monster, and uh, that kind of pays off big time later in the movie. Yeah, it does. But no, that that's such a great scene. It is a great, it is a great scene. I, I, you know, I, you Google Fly 2, and uh, what comes up uh, is Fly 2 Dog. And uh, there's a whole lot of people attest to the fact that the dog scenes in Fly 2 are among the most excruciating scenes that they've ever watched. That scene and then the end scene of the movie, when I was a kid, I had it on VHS. Yeah. So I must have been four or five when I was watching some of these movies. Cause back then, oh, jeez. Like, <laughs> back in the day, even I'm sure when you were growing up, it was like whatever was on you could watch. But now, yeah. obviously, that. I have a six-month-old daughter. I would I wouldn't let her watch Fly <laughs> Two or, or when I watched Nightmare on Elm Street at a very young age and I couldn't sleep for a while. Right. So no, that that scene definitely. And even rewatching it, uh, yeah. Oh man, it just got me. I actually found the opening scene, the birth scene, to be the most difficult to watch, the most horrifying. Yeah. No, that was scene. pretty rough. Yeah. And that movie had a great cast. Do you remember how long uh, long of a shoot it was for you? Uh, yeah, it was one day. Um, okay. Yeah, it was one day. I mean, I had to go in and, and uh, get fitted for the prosthetic fingers. So that was the big deal, right? That this, this yeah. dog monster bit off a couple of my fingers. And there was only like a flash of it in the movie. But right after the movie, I got a whole spread in Fangoria magazine where they, oh, really? they sort of they featured the, uh, the bitten off um, finger effect. So that that was kind of cool. But, yeah, so I just, you know, I had a fitting for the prosthetic fingers and went in and uh, shot the scene in one day. And um, I think I made, like, uh, 300 bucks uh, on it. Okay. And I've been getting um, residuals ever since. Oh, nice. It's one of the two movies that I got the most residuals for in my life, even though I was only in the one scene and I only made a couple hundred bucks. But... The fly two and look who's talking. Just keep, just keep on giving. Well, I'm sure look, look who's talking must be that movie crushed in the box office. Yeah, but the fly two is, is surprised me. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if the fly is shown over and over and over again. But the fly two, I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you remember the first? Did you see the first one? I didn't. Uh, I, oh, okay. I, I mean, I may have seen it, but I don't remember seeing it. I just, I, yeah. I, I, I just read, I read uh, the Wikipedia entry about it. I remember Jeff Goldblum. I'm sure I've seen, you know, scenes from it, or I saw the trailer or something. But, uh, but no, I don't. I don't think I actually did see the movie. Yeah, I remember seeing. I, I had a lot of VHSs that were the sequels. My dad yeah. used to get them. He was a garbage man, so he used to get like a lot of free movies from people and right. it just happened to be like sequels so that's why I kind of started this whole thing because I, I always find them so interesting that just doing a follow up of a movie that sometimes it involves like the, the storyline sometimes it's just something off the wall like some movies but so what right. do you think of the what do you think of the fly too as a whole I didn't think it was that bad. I mean, again, reading about it online, you know, it got some really terrible reviews and uh, yeah. it's got very low ratings on Rotten Tomatoes and and uh, on IMDb, I think it's got a five rating, which isn't the lowest I've ever been on, but it's, you know, it's not very good. I thought that was pretty good, actually. It's the acting, I thought Eric Stoltz was good. I thought that the, the um, kid who played that played the the Brundle character as a kid was really good. Oh yeah. And uh you know, I mean it was okay. To, in retrospect, the special effects are a little cheesy and like the like the archaic computers are uh, are a, a laugh, but you know, it was 1989, yeah. so um that's what you got back then. Uh Yeah, and most horror movies and most comedies as a whole don't have like great rotten tomatoes or IMDb scores. It's yeah. not like these movies are out to be, you know, The Godfather. Right, exactly. You know, a movie about a kid that's a fly and, you know, he has... So, no, no, it's an interesting movie. I yeah. always liked it. So. And, I mean, Cronen, you know, Cronenberg didn't write or direct this movie. No. Um, so, yeah. you know, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, it had a very, much lower budget and uh, et cetera. 
Uh, but I was glad to be I was glad to be in it. You know, it was one of those um got my fingers bitten off. It's one of those key <laughs> moments in my film career. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then you were on some pretty uh, pretty awesome shows over the years. Uh twenty one Jump Street you were on multiple yeah. times. Yeah, which that was really the interesting. Cast for that show was awesome. The cast for that show was awesome. And um when I when I uh I tell people about my experience on twenty one Jump Street it's really kind of about watching Johnny Depp because even back, even then, Johnny Depp was like a star. He was a young star. He hadn't completely like exploded into the firmament yet, but um, but he was a star and he was like surrounded by handlers and he was this you know young, really good-looking guy and he was the star of the show and they were in Vancouver for five years. Vancouver was like nowhere. Here's this young, budding, stud star. And he was so professional. And he was so cool and funny and friendly and easy to be around. And just so unlike the cliche of that kind of, that kind of, um, you know, kind of Hollywood kid who's spoiled and has everything and just, you know, doesn't really have to be on time and doesn't have to take anything seriously and can trash his hotel room and party all bit all night and stuff like that. Like he was just the opposite of that. And, um, you know, he got, he got a little crazy as a, as an adult, but yeah. as a young, um, as a young actor, uh, he was really cool. I really, I had a lot of respect for him in retrospect that, uh, you know, I don't know if if I had been in his, if I had been lucky enough to be in his place, I don't know if I would have handled it as well as he did. Yeah, that's great. You can look at it that way and be honest. Some people mm. would be like, some people might say, "Oh, you know, you know, I know exactly how to do it," but no, <laughs> it's so hard when you have everybody that is just going to yes to you, yes to you, and then you have it's just yeah, no, exactly that. that, that that's exactly it. Yeah, and I and I've seen a lot of and I've seen a lot of uh, other young. Uh, American actors who come up here to do shows, you know, they're, they're always like dissing the place. They go home every weekend. Can't wait to get out of here. Uh, you know, the crews are an American cruise and the food isn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, Johnny Depp was, he could easily have, have, uh, pulled that kind of attitude, but he never did. So good for him, I say. That's awesome. The right around that time you mentioned, look who's talking. Yeah. That was, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Um, and again, like nobody knew it was going to be this giant, giant successful movie. But um, I had, uh, again, I just had a couple of scenes, but it was a cool little character. Like I always tell people, you know, that I was responsible for um, for uh, Kirstie Alley and John Travolta getting together because uh, yeah. <laughs> um, because my character was like one of the ultimate bad dates. And then it was, and yeah, so that was, that was really a, a really a sweet experience. Um, and, uh, Amy Heckling, who was the director, was also very, very cool. They just, there weren't very many feature film female directors at that time. So that was another kind of interesting experience just to be around a set where this, you know, really kind of relaxed creative woman was, uh, was in charge. And was getting, you know, respect from some pretty, you know, some pretty, pretty big time and, and, uh, experienced actors. George Siegel was in it and Olympia Dukakis and Bruce Willis. And, um, so that was, that was a really good experience. Again, I had a small part and I was only on set for a couple of days, but, uh, it's, you know, it's been, it's been a movie that's really paid off for me in a lot of different ways. Yeah. And it's a great scene. I've seen that movie a million times. And yeah. Those scenes are so great when he pulls you aside and says uh, she doesn't like having the door held for or paying for the checks. So I know that's right. great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I worked with Chris Yelly a couple of other times, and she's also a really interesting character, you know. She's a little eccentric, and she's uh, gotten some bad press, and she's kind of done some foolish things and gained weight and lost weight and all that. But she's a really good comic actor, really fine comic yeah. actor. And again, you know, someone who has been really serious about her craft, even with all the other stuff that's gone on in her life and career. And and uh, I really enjoyed working with her. I did a I did a TV movie with her later on 
called, uh, I think it was called Right and Wrong, where she was a Hollywood screenwriter and it was about how she couldn't, she couldn't get respect in Hollywood because she was a woman. And, um, uh, it, it was, it was another really kind of interesting, interesting performance from someone who often, you know, kind of people laugh at because Kirstie Alley, you know, she's a Scientologist. Yeah, well, she's also a really good actor. Uh, no, I'd have to go, I'd have to look on, on my Oh, no, it's IMDb. okay. Yeah. I'm sure I'll be able to find it. But no, the reason I asked is that, I, I don't know, was it like late, late nineties, you think? Early 2000s? Uh, hang on, I'm gonna find it right now. I'm just, right. just kind of scrolling. Cause that's, a, that's not a topic that people would talk about. Like you mentioned before, like, having one of the few female directors you're able to work with. It was, uh, 2007. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2007. And, yeah, oh, I, I can't it. remember. It was a TV movie. I can't remember what. Uh, oh, it was for Lifetime, actually. Yeah, it was a Lifetime movie, 2007. Yeah, yeah. And did you, do you guys, like, remember each other or, like, reminisce? Because you've been on a lot of sets, so I'm sure there's people you've worked yeah, with. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of reintroduced myself to her and uh, and reminded her, and she said, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember, and... And um, I think it was the Super Bowl was on around the time we were filming, and so we watched some football together. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. You're like, hey, I was your really bad date. I'm the I'm the reason you got with Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of her bad dates. There was a whole series of bad dates in that. Yeah, one, yeah. I was Mr. The... Mr. Anal. And yeah. Send back the you know the send back the uh, the silverware, and I wouldn't drink yeah. from the water, and yeah. <laughs> no, that was so great, and. uh yeah, so one show you were on that was like right around that time, and you had multiple appearances, and then later on you were in a bunch of them. Uh, Wise guy, yeah, really. I, I I worked with a guy who was in his fifties or sixties, and he told me to watch it. So like every day he would bring in these DVDs, and he's like, "Come on, bring it home, and watch it." So like I finally watched it. I think it was only the first season he gave me when Ray, Ray Sharkey was still on it. But talk oh, yeah. about like an underrated show. That show was so yeah. good. It was a really good show. So <clears throat> the big breakthrough in Vancouver happened in around 1987. It was par- part of it was the Fox Network starting up, and because they were just a startup and they were trying to save money, they came up to Canada to film because at that time the Canadian dollar was worth about 60 cents to the U.S. dollar, and so it, they saved a lot of money. But the, bi- just the other big breakthrough was right around the same time, 87, 88, Stephen J. Cannell came up to Vancouver and he opened this, he built a studio and he shot all of his series up here and Wise Guy was one of, Wise Guy was probably the best. It was in one of the first of his series and and, and one of the longest lasting, I think it was four or five seasons. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, it was really, the writing was really good on that show and uh, very gritty uh, acting and uh, yeah, it's a good, good show. I really enjoyed being on that. I, I think I've, I've always liked uh, playing. Uh, I've always liked cop shows. You know, I like the yeah. of, I like the grit of uh, of that kind of uh, that genre. And I played a lot of cops, a lot of detectives. Not so and much a lot of white, cops right? and docs. And, yeah, a lot of doctors, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of cops, yeah. a lot of lawyers. Yeah. yeah. But you know that that's what that those are the parts that there are the, like the most parts there are are middle aged male. Character actors playing cops, lawyers, and doctors. That's, you know, if you broke down parts by, like, profession and age and gender, it's middle-aged male cops. That would make oh, up really? probably 60% of the of the characters on, on TV. Not so much now when everything is, like, sci-fi, but... Um, but back then, when cop shows were in the golden age, that's, uh, that's, that's what was going on. So, yeah. <laughs> And another movie that you played a cop, uh, in, in Stay Tuned. Yeah, I had a really small part in that. Um, but, uh, it was my first time, um, seeing John Ritter in action. That was pretty, pretty amazing experience. I did a TV movie with him later on where I actually had a few scenes with him. Oh, and, uh, he was, he was fantastic. I never worked with Robin Williams, but, um, John Ritter was the closest I've ever come to the Robin Williams kind of character who was he was he was like a speed freak he was always on 
he was always improvising. He was always making jokes. He just, you know, the guy was just wired from beginning to end. And, uh, you know, it's not surprising to me that he, that he had a short life. He just, you know, he like burned out. He was so, um, he was just so on all the time. Really a talented guy, but, but exhausting to be around. Yeah, he was in a lot of, uh, a lot of funny movies and like, like you mentioned how on he was and like that movie, I don't think it would work with really any other actors because it's such a yeah. silly concept getting sucked into the satellite dish and switching yeah. channels and Jeffrey Jones playing like a Satan-ish character. But, uh, right. that, that, no, that is a great movie. And then another movie, I'm sure another small part, but almost you were mentioning like the fly too and you're getting your hand bitten off and like how, gross in a way some of those scenes are but yeah you're you were the co-pilot in the movie alive and that's a really <clears throat> yeah that was um if i had to choose one uh movie or a tv series that like was my best experience that was my best experience for lots really? of really what well, yeah yeah so Why is that? uh so um it's a true story first of all yeah yeah so i read the book the book is absolutely fantastic so it's this uruguayan um, rugby team that was flying to Chile for a match over the Andes in the winter, and they crash landed on a glacier at I don't know like twelve thousand feet, and um, there was no radio contact, and so everyone thought that they were that everyone had died in the in the plane crash. Everyone back home, and that, and they would go up and find them in the spring when uh, the thaw came, and they could get up the mountain. But in fact, there were survivors. About half the plane survived, and and they were there for like three months until uh, one of the guys, two of the guys, actually hiked out and um, got help. And but to survive for those three months, they cannibalized the the dead bodies of their friends who were killed in the crash. And when they got back home, there was a big scandal because it leaked out that they had they had survived by by cannibalizing their friends. So anyway, so the movie is a really good adaptation of that really powerful story. So I was the co-pilot and call, my character is called the co-pilot, but I was actually flying the plane. So and it was my, it was my fault that the plane crashed. I had, one, <laughs> I had one really great scene before I died, which was a really kind of disgusting scene where the pilots were kind of crushed in the nose of the plane, but um, my character wasn't quite dead, and two of the guys come into the cockpit to try and use the radio to radio for help. The radio's dead, and uh, they try to get information from me, and I kind of mumble out that I want them to get my gun because I want to I want to shoot myself because I'm I am, I'm in such bad shape and such pain. So what was great about it was it's a great story. It was a nice, nice little part. Really good actors. Ethan Hawke was the main uh, play yeah, the main character. Yeah, I saw that. I've seen that movie. I, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I didn't even realize that was him. Yeah, but um, but the best things about it were so it was directed by Frank Marshall. So Frank Marshall and Kathy Kennedy are like the king and queen producers. Um, in Hollywood, like they produced the Star Wars movies, they produced Back to Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, the Bourne movies, and um, this was only the second movie that that Frank directed, uh, and Kathy Kennedy produced it, um, and uh, and they were so they were like Hollywood royalty, and but they were fantastically nice and generous, and one of the things that so. The actors who played the the kids on the the guy the young man on the plane who survived um, went on this. They shot they shot the the film in continuity because the actors had to lose weight over the course of the film and oh, grow wow. beards and stuff. And so because they were living on like a thousand calories a day, and so the they put the actors on this thousand calorie a day survivors diet. And Kathy Kennedy, like one of the biggest producers in Hollywood went on the diet with them, kind of in Whoa. solidarity with the actors, which I thought was just so fantastic. Um, it was filmed uh, It was filmed in the Rockies, in Canadian Rockies, and on a glacier, and like um, they'd fly us up in the helicopter to the top of a glacier every day, which is 
really super cool. That is um, really cool. In a kind of a ski uh, uh, a ski resort. But the very best thing about it was, because it was a relatively big budget Hollywood film, they brought all of the actual survivors of the plane crash from Montevideo, Uruguay, up onto set as consultants. Whoa. And so um, I was able to talk to the two real guys who were the last people to talk to my character before he died. And I was able to watch the 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 main guy, the guy that Ethan Hawke played, um, one of the it's like his mother and um his mother the his mother and sister were on the plane and were killed in the crash and he had a necklace that his actual sister wore in the uh, on the plane and he gave it to to uh, Ileana Douglas who played his sister in the movie and she wore wow. it in the scene so I was I was able to watch him watching the scene where his mother and sister are killed and it was really powerful stuff. And these were very interesting guys. They were educated, professional, very articulate. And um, so that whole experience was just uh, amazing. It was an amazing, amazing experience in every way. And that just sounds the way, like you mentioned, how powerful they are, the king and queen of Hollywood. They do things right to be able to fly them so yeah. everything is correct and... Yeah, that's a yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the perk. It's one of the perks of of a, a big budget feature film is that um, th- those kinds of things are are doable. Um, whereas in most of the kinds of projects that I've been involved in, they wouldn't be doable at all. But but at the, you know, but again, it was like it was kind of like my experience with Johnny Depp. Like here were these these people who could have been obnoxious power trippers and they were just the most gracious lovely and you know smart creative talented people at the same time um that kind of you know that kind of combination in any business is is hard to find but in showbiz it's uh it's really rare so when you you know when you um when you get it you really have to you got to savor it yeah that's such an amazing experience yeah, since you've been in a lot over the years, and thanks so much for taking the time. I don't want to take too much, but uh, so what are what was some of your favorite experience? Like, because you were in a lot of series over the year. Yeah, you were in Madison, Cold Squad. Uh, yeah, Madison, Cold Squad are, uh, were Canadian series. Cold Squad was cool. It was a cop. Uh, it was a cop series, and I was uh, the the head of homicide, the chief detective for the the first season. They wrote me out in the second season; it just kind of broke my heart. Madison was a cool uh, a, a kind of a teen soap opera um, that took place. Madison was the name of the high school, and um, I was the dad of like the bad kid, the bad boy in uh, high school. So that that was a lot of fun. There were, there were some very talented people came out of that. Will Sasso was uh, one of oh, the yeah. kids who kind of emerged from... Oh, you know what? From... I actually, I don't know if he was there at the same time. Now that you mentioned it's a Canadian show, I interviewed yeah. uh, Matt Hill. Was he on oh, the yeah. show when you were there? Uh, don't think so. I um, mean, he might have been. He might have had like a guest star thing. But uh, he was, I don't think he was one of the regulars. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think um, he might have been on maybe the earlier years. You were on it in yeah. 97? Uh, I was on it for five seasons, I think. Um, oh, okay. But uh, he's only on a couple episodes, so maybe yeah, we can probably yeah. get together. I think he, I think his character was like bully or something. But I talked to uh, him, and remember. he was a really down to earth guy. Yeah, no, he's he's a cool guy. Oh, he yeah, he did uh, Ninja Turtles, right? He did like, the yeah. voice of the Ninja Turtles. That's yeah. He was one of the suit actors in the third one, so I talked to him about that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was a really, really cool guy. Some great stories, but uh, there's a lot. There's yeah. a lot of really great, great actors up here. Um, my favorite oh, yeah. series, just to get back to that, I, I don't want to keep you all day, but, but definitely my favorite s- series experience, other than Beans Baxter, was um, Beggars and Choosers. So that was a, that was a, a series on Showtime um, around the year 2000, and it was it was it was really a really creative show. It was about a fictional TV network. And uh and I was the lawyer. I was like the I was like the corporate lawyer for the um for the head of the the head of the network. 
it was a show that was kind of ahead of its time. I think if it, you know, 10 years later with, uh, with the proliferation of cable shows, it would have, it would probably still be running, but it was canceled towards the end of the second season. But it was a really good show, really good. It's not even, I don't even think it's available on DVD. Um, but, uh, there was a cast of uh, dozens and, uh, it was just all about the kind of absurdities of life in Hollywood, you know, before Entourage and, before all those other shows that became really popular. Um, yeah. So that, I think that was, I'd have to say that was a great experience for me. That's awesome. Yeah. I know you mentioned some great actors that you worked with, but was there, was there anybody else that you had a great experience with over the years? Well, I've had lots of, uh, lots of uh, oh, really sure. good experiences. I would say um, uh, I had a really small part in a, a movie with Sidney Poitier called Shoot to Kill. Oh. Uh, early on in my career, again, kind of the like 87 or something like that. Um, it, it wasn't a very good movie, but I was, we were cops together and, uh, that was kind of thrilling. Um, I was on iRobot. I was, uh, you know, Will Smith and I were cops together. Uh, that was kind of cool. I think my favorite of all these was a TV movie called, um, A Cooler Climate with uh, Sally Field and Judy Davis, who both got nominated for Emmys um, for that. It was kind of a soap opera-ish movie. Uh, and Sally Field was awesome. She was really something to to watch. Very calm. Again, super nice and super professional. And um, if you ever get a chance to read her memoir, which which she published last year, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic book. She's it's really one of these really smart people. Like she wrote her own book. It wasn't ghost written or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Anyway, I played Judy Davis. Out. I played Judy Davis's husband, and she was really difficult. Um, she was a really difficult person to be around. She d- kind of didn't want to be in the movie. And um, there was a Susan Seidelman was the director, the mo- woman who directed um, Desperately Seeking Susan, okay. and. Uh, they never got along very well, and uh, it was it was it was hard sometimes to kind of watch this um, this uh, star actress uh, rebelling against um, her female director. Partly, I think, because it was a woman who was directing, and um, so that was that was a it was both a really exciting experience because it was. Uh, it was such a high quality um, uh, project and with really talented people, but also kind of hard to hard to be around uh, that kind of conflict, um, public conflict on set where an actor and a director are kind of going at each other in front of the whole crew. Didn't much like that part of it. Yeah, I bet. Is it hard to, for you, since you obviously, I'm sure, had a lot of scenes with her, do you typically usually try to work with that person, like like reading the script, uh, like off camera? Yeah, yeah, you try, but, you know, it. there is a hierarchy in, uh, in, in television and film, and um, stars aren't always willing to... Uh, uh, to spend time off camera with, uh, with the hired hands they have to, um, they have to do scenes with. So, you know, kind of again, again, it depends a lot on, on the actor. Um, like I've done a couple of movies with Ethan Hawke and he's just another one of these really fantastic, smart, um, uh, artists who is also just like a gen- gen- genuinely nice person, a really, really down to earth, regular guy um so yeah so and it kind of it kind of varies um from actor to actor will smith i would have liked to have i did have a you know a couple of scenes with him i would have liked to have worked with him but on irobot you couldn't get near will smith he had this posse um that was with him at all times and you were you know unless you were like actually on camera you weren't allowed within, you know, like 20 feet of the guy. And uh, oh, wow. between scenes, he and his posse would go. They they had a, a gym that was attached to his trailer, and they would go back and they'd work out. Um, 
in the gym. And so that was kind of disappointing. I would have liked to have would have liked to have talked to him. That's gotta be hard on set, like not being able to uh well, you know, you, involved. you adjust, right? You adjust. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, they're your best friends, and sometimes you're just, you know, you're just a hired hand, and you're doing your job, and you uh, you do it, and you do it as best you can, and, and you go home. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, like, for me, even though I have a lot of, it's true, I have a lot of credits, and I've had a lot of good parts, but most of my parts, have been essentially day jobs, you know. Um, one or two sceners where I come in and my character, you know, delivers information or something like that. And, uh, you know, the day player is a whole different category from the star. Yeah. You often come in, like if it's a series and you get hired as a, a guest star for one episode, you don't really know the history of that series. You don't know the history of the of the actors and whether they got along or not. You don't really know. You're just kind of stepping in in the middle of something, and nobody really ever tells. No, nobody ever really fills in the backstory for you, except in the most minimal ways, like information that you absolutely need to do it. But um, but it's you know it's kind of awkward. It's like you know there's this, like this family that's together for year or two and you're there for one day and you know they're just not that interested in spending time with you so so you learn to do your job as as efficiently and as effectively as possible and then get out and just kind of keep a low profile you know I don't try and like rewrite my lines like a lot of actors do and uh, I don't necessarily try and you know make friends with the other actors I will often I'm trying to get a photo you know, if I'm doing a scene with somebody, I'll say, uh, you know, can like between scenes, can, is it all right if uh, I get somebody to take to take a, a photo of us together? And you know, nine, 99 times out of 100, they'll say, yeah, sure. But so I've got it. You know, I've got a photo with Sidney Poitier, right? I mean, oh, that's, that's awesome. I think that is awesome. That is that is really cool. Yeah. So uh, it's great that you, it's great that you mentioned that. So I uh, I interviewed Jason Kravitz, and he's been in a bunch of stuff. And he was uh, the last episodes of Friends. Yeah. And he said when he was on set for that, kind of like what you just mentioned, him and Paul Rudd were standing next to each other, and they said how awkward it was for them because the four, you know, the main characters of the, of the show were the ones that were so emotionally involved because they were sure. worked together for so long. So he said, like, watching them during the final scenes, like, crying, they yeah. said it just felt so awkward. Because oh, yeah. they were like, I don't know what, I don't know, like, what to do. Should we, like, look away or, like, go outside? Yeah, you know, go I'm outside. Going, I'd go outside. You know, you just want to stay out of the way. It's not, it's yeah. their, it's their life. It's not even yeah. your business at all. <laughs> so just speaking of that, so I, I did a couple of, uh, a couple of, I did a couple of episodes of this very short-lived series with Jason Alexander called Hit the okay. Road. And he's another like John Ritter um uh guy, you know, really really funny and kind of on all the time. Um very very funny guy, but unfortunately the series was was pretty bad and I don't even think they finished the first season. But oh, it was wow. fun it was fun to work with him. It was uh, he's again a really, you know, like these comics, man, they just exist on another plane that's uh, different from the plane that those of us who live normal lives live on. They're just like their minds are going a mile a minute. And they're always thinking up new gags and, and you know, they just look at the world in a different way. Yeah, that show looked like it would have been pretty cool. It was on like an AT&T network. Yeah, it was on one of those uh, relatively obscure. I don't even know what they are because we don't get them in Canada. But um, yeah. but yeah, so again, it was like the first season. They were kind of trying stuff out. They probably, if it had gone to a second season, they might have you know moved it back to L.A. But um, it was it was cool getting to work with him. Uh, he he's a again a really talented guy. I've also done I've done a couple. I was, I was looking through my IMDb in, um, in preparation for this. And I realized that I've also been in a couple of movies that have been rated among, like, the worst of all time. And what are some of those? 
<laughs> and, well, one of them was Mr. Magoo, um, which is on IMDb. It has like a 3.1 um, rating. But, I had a really nice part in that, and I enjoyed that one. Oh, yeah? No, I, I, no. Yeah, because I only I lost a leg, so I had a prosthetic uh, I had a prosthetic leg, which was kind of cool. But the other one and the worst one, a lot of people say this is the worst movie ever made, was Blonde and Blonder with Pamela Anderson. I never even heard of that one. Either. Well, for for very good reason, for very <laughs> very good reason. Yes, um, we covered one of the worst ones already earlier. We did uh, Son of the Mask. I don't know if you ever seen. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I, I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for you. <laughs> Lucky for me, yes. Yeah. And uh, so one, one, a few more things. And again, thanks so much for taking so much time. I'm sure you're a fan of Police Academy. You were on the the series oh, for an episode. That was one of my favorites. That was one of my yeah. favorite episodes because I played a dead guy. Like so, I <laughs> so I'm this mafia guy and. Uh, I have a heart attack at a dinner in the, like oh, under the opening credits, and then Joe Flaherty, who is really funny, um, who plays one of the cops, he's like one of the SCTV guys. Uh, he has to, I forget what the I forget what the deal was, but he has to pretend that I'm alive, and so he hauls my dead body around through the whole episode. So I got to play this. So they made they put this like white face um, makeup on me. And I got to play a dead guy for an entire 30-minute episode. Uh, and that was, that was really fun, you know, because you have to, it's not like you're, you're a dead guy lying on the ground face down. Like you're a dead guy that they put in a chair to try and make other people believe you're, an, you're a live guy. So you have to control your breathing. You can't laugh. You can't scratch your nose. Um, that was a really fun gig. So if anybody's listening, if they are going to re- reboot Weekend at Bernie's, call Jerry Watson. He can play <laughs> That's right. a good That's right. Actually, this episode was called something like that. It was called Weekend uh, what? at something. Yeah, it was a play on Weekend at Bernie's. It's exactly what it was. <laughs> That's, oh, it says, oh, Dead Man Talking It was the name of the Oh, Dead Man Talking. Oh, yeah. I knew. Uh, okay. So it was a play on one of those things. Uh, yeah, dead guys. I, I had a lot of. I died in a lot of really kind of interesting ways over the years too. Um, <laughs> any any favorites? Well, m- most recently I was I was I played the president of the United States on the Flash, and I was killed by aliens. You're and killed even by super, aliens. Even killed by aliens, and even it was an alien invasion, and they blew me up, and even Supergirl couldn't couldn't save me. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that was right up there. Right up That's there. That's so cool. That's so <laughs> awesome. And I know you, you just mentioned you were on iZombie, I guess. Was it a pretty recent yeah. episode? Yeah, it was. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was just on, I guess they just repeated it last um, last week. <clears throat> Again, I was just on, I was just in the one scene. I wasn't a zombie. I ran a restaurant that served um, heads to uh, zombies, and... Um, uh-huh. And uh, my heads were all stolen, um, so I was very upset. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so that was one of those. So that was one of those. Um, that was one of those shows where I came in um, in the middle of, a, of like their last season. It was like their fifth or sixth season. All these people had been working together for all these years. I'd never seen the show. Uh, and I had to. I had to do a lot of guessing um, at uh, you know what the relationships were both among the characters and among the actors. And again, I mean, fortunately for me, it was a really relaxed, cool set, and everybody was really nice. But, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it's tricky. It's tricky being a day player in uh, in those kinds of situations. Back in the day, back in the 80s and 90s, um, it was sort of the golden age of, uh, really even before cable, it was kind of the golden age of TV movies. And for some reason, like for a while, Vancouver was like the TV movie producing capital of the world. And um, I really enjoyed working in TV movies because you didn't really have that experience where people had, you know, people were together for months or years and you were coming in in the middle of something that you didn't really know about. Everybody kind of started together and, and ended together. And even if you're all, even if you're only a day player, the you know the entire movie was being shot in you know in 18 days or something. So there wasn't a lot of time for people to develop uh, to develop histories that you weren't a part of. I got to do a lot of great stuff. Again, I was looking through my IMDb, 
<clears throat> so I did the, the first professional job that um, Sandra O oh ever had after she came out of theater school was um, a Canadian uh, biopic called The Diary of Evelyn Lau that was based, that was the adaptation of a memoir by this, uh, this young Asian uh, Canadian woman who had become, was like, uh, ran away from home and became a hooker for a while and then uh, sort of straightened her life out and became a, became a writer. And Sandra O oh played the part and um, I played this really like the sleaziest guy I've ever played who uh, <laughs> picks her up for a blowjob. And, uh, which doesn't happen. She ends up running away. But it was really powerful. It was, she, again, like nobody knew who she was. She was just this kid out of theater school. But yeah. she was a, it was a really intense show. She was a really intense actor. This was a very intense scene. It was shot in the middle of the night on a rainy pier. She's wearing these, you know, sort of high heel hooker shoes and she has to run away down this like wooden pier and try not to get her her heel caught in in like the spaces between the wooden slats so she doesn't break her ankles. It was it was looking back on it, that was really a really cool experience for me, um, given who Sandra O oh became, right? So this is like before she be, she was anybody. So that was yeah. cool. That was uh, She must have been super young. She must have been in her early She was. 20s. She was probably I don't know, she was probably twenty. I mean literally she was right out of theater school. Maybe she oh she was in her early twenties anyway. Um yeah. but it, but even, you know, again, it was one of those things where you just knew this kid was gonna be a star, even though she didn't have like the conventional star look. Right. A she's Asian and B she's she's not conventionally pretty. Um, but, but boy, she's, she can act. So that was, that was really cool. I did a really good, uh, another really good, I thought, um, TV movie, uh, with, uh, Rob Lowe and Jennifer Grey called Outrage, where I played a cop. That was a, that was a cool experience. Those are two people that, that are pretty awesome to work with. Rob Lowe. Yeah. He's pretty, he's pretty down to earth. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got some attitude. He's got some attitude. Jennifer Grey was was very down to earth. Um, she was interesting. Um, I did a movie. I, I did a movie with Joan Rivers, which was kind of interesting, only because up close she looked so weird. She had so much plastic surgery on her nose that her nose practically disappeared. It was like this little thin. You, it felt like if you breathed on her nose, it would break. Um, so, you know, just like seeing like a famous person from TV up close, you think, oh, that's what they really look like? Holy shit. And it's wild <laughs> how how she looks when you watch like the old roasts in the, yeah. the Dean Martin roast, like what she looked like then. Yeah. And then yeah. what she looked like later on. And, she, yeah. she had a lot of work, that girl. She did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So do you have so, anything yeah, else just, you're working um, on that's coming out, out anytime soon? No, actually, uh, I don't have anything in the pipeline. Um, I just actually, um, I auditioned for Peter DeLuise. We were talking earlier about um, 21 Jump Street. Yeah. So he he was one of the guys. He's, oh, okay. I, I think he's become a full-time director. I don't think he acts anymore at, at all. He directs quite a bit up here. So I'm waiting to hear about that. Uh, it's a TV movie. But... Um, I've auditioned for a. Uh, I've got an audition for a Hallmark Christmas movie at uh, on Tuesday. Hallmark's kind of taken over where Channel um, left off as the sort of mainstay. Like they've moved all of, I think, all of their production up to Vancouver. And, oh wow! You know they've got like they've got like a half dozen series and and like a half dozen movies going on at any one time. It's like a it's a factory. Uh, so that's is it really because good. of the cost? Is, is it low cost to shoot there, or I think it's because of the cost. Yeah, I mean yeah. everything is cheaper up here. The dollar is cheap right now. The Canadian dollar is about seventy five cents U S. So okay. you're you know so you're getting a, a thirty you're getting a one third premium for your American buck. Um, the cost of actors and crew up here is less. There's a really great uh, infrastructure that's developed over the last thirty years. Um, crews are really, really good. There's lots of pretty good actors, and there's and there's fantastic range of locations. You know, there's urban, there's 
there is mountains, there is water, there is forests. You can be anywhere. It used to be like every every show shot in Vancouver was either set in nowhere land or it was set in Seattle. And yeah. now, um, you know, now that there's a whole range of, of of places that Vancouver stands in for, and sometimes it even stands in for itself. Not yeah. very often, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um so yeah, I I'm pretty sure that Hallmark is up here for the for the costs. I don't think they're up here for because they like Canada or they like Canada <laughs> or like that. Be nice. Well, everybody, be nice everybody you know? likes everybody, everybody likes, likes Canadians because we're so nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're an officially a Canadian. I well, I have dual citizenship. I uh I got my finally got my Canadian citizenship. So for a while the, you couldn't you couldn't get dual you couldn't get a dual citizenship if you were an American citizen until, like, I think the late 80s or 90s. So I think in around 1992 or three, I got my Canadian citizenship. So when I travel to the States, I use my American passport. And when I come back to Canada, I use my Canadian passport. And I have to uh, file taxes in both countries, unfortunately, even though I only pay tax in one country. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's really good. My uh, uh, my two Canadian kids both have also have American citizenship. Oh, cool! My son lives and works in uh, Brooklyn, so that that works oh, out really up. well for him. Yeah. No, you visit him and show him your old stomping grounds. <laughs> yeah, well, aren't there anymore? In Brooklyn, I never actually. I hardly ever got. I hardly ever got into Brooklyn. You know, when I was growing up, you were either from the Bronx or you were from Brooklyn. You were either, you were either a Yankee fan or a Dodger fan. There was like yeah. nothing in between. No one was ever a Giants fan. There were, you know, the Giants baseball team existed then, but like I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Like maybe if you lived in Manhattan, you were a Giants fan. Yeah, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's nice. It's nice going back and seeing. Man, New York has changed a lot over the years, over uh, the decades no. since I lived there for sure. But yeah, it's been, I'll tell you, it's been very, very interesting for me um, as an American living in Canada and kind of straddling the border and being able to see and experience both countries and both cultures from both sides of the border. It's a really, it's a really unique and privileged perspective. I think I'm very lucky to... um, to be where I am and to and to have the kind of uh, you know to have the kind of knowledge of like American culture that I have and yet um I don't have to live there right now uh, yeah. which I'm pretty happy about <laughs> I <bet. laughs> um I, you know I still get to vote uh, the last place I lived was in upstate New York so I get to uh I get to absentee vote uh oh, in really? New York state oh, no. yeah so I can vote for in the presidential elections and I can vote in the congressional elections and um but uh but I don't regret I don't regret the move at all. I I really have become a real Canadian nationalist over the years. I think it's a it's an amazingly wonderful country with um problems of its own, but um nothing on the scale of the of the problems that I think the US has right now. Yeah. Sorry to say. Yeah, no, I I hear you. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jerry, you've had an amazing career. Thank well, you I so hope it's not over. Time. Don't talk about it in the past tense. <laughs> oh, well, up until this point, it's going to keep going. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, hey, one thing I wrote down before we were chatting, I forgot to mention it. You yep. were talking about how grave an experience and how, like, down to earth Ethan Hawke was. I yep. don't know if you're a fan of uh, Stranger Things or kids watch it. I'm not a fan. You know, I have never watched it, actually. Is he on an episode? No, his daughter is one of the stars in the in the latest season and uh you're she was kidding. Great. Yeah. No, oh, I didn't great. know that. I didn't know that. I have to watch that. Yeah, that he is, wrote that's... something yeah, he wrote something I don't know if it was on social media or something, like congratulating her and uh I was like, No way. But yeah. Really? Yeah, so when you said that before I was like, Oh, let me jot that down and let you know. But yeah, if you ever do check it out, it's a cool show but yeah. it's just really cool that his daughter's like following in his footsteps. Oh, no kidding, no kidding. Um yeah. I had uh an experience with Meryl Streep's daughter. Um oh, really? I worked on yeah, again a short lived uh a network um doctor show called Emily Owens M D. Um I don't think it lasted well it was on one season. And she was the star, Mamie Gummer, and um I had an episode with her. She again 
really cool. Uh, if you didn't know that she was Meryl Streep's daughter, you wouldn't have known it because she didn't, you know, didn't use her didn't use her leverage in any way. And she, um, but she looks like her. You could see it in the face. She looks like her a little bit. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. I just picked yeah. her up. The, I've never seen her before, but yeah. Yeah, and again, a really good. I mean, not quite Meryl Streep quality, but a really good actor. Well, I'm sure will have a, a a pretty decent career on her own. So yeah, but thanks for that tip. I will definitely check out uh, yeah. the young hawk girl. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, thanks so much. It's well, I appreciate story. it. Thanks for uh, thanks for choosing me. Hey, thanks for accepting it. Good luck with the project. It's a, a really cr- a great uh, podcast. I really enjoyed listening to oh, the uh, episodes you. I've heard so far. Yeah. All right, so that's Jerry Wasserman. I'll put his IMDb link so you could check out all his credits. Such a cool guy. I talked to him. It was last summer, and uh, it was just the timing of actually doing this movie and coordinate everything, but with everybody on lockdown, it made it just a little bit easier. So, uh, yeah, Jerry's great. Now, your homework is to watch Fly 2. There's some options to find online. If you have Cinemax, it's on there, but then there's other ways you can find it. So, yeah, check it out. Don't forget to review, rate, share our podcast. Tell all your friends all of them, even your neighbors, but at a safe distance. And check out our website, sequelsonly.com. Follow us on all social media at sequelsonly. Stay safe and good night.